Hey, Church Online family, for those of you who are new to our church or just don't know me, my name is Pastor John. My wife, Pastor Andrea, and I have been the campus pastors at our Nazareth location for the last eight years or so, and most recently positioned as Life Church's lead pastor successor designees, which means this year we're leading alongside our amazing founding pastors, pastors Randy and Maribel, learning from them, gleaning from them, serving with them. Then on January 7th, 2024, the baton will be handed off officially, and we will be Life Church's new lead pastors. And so now we get the opportunity, the honor, the privilege to pastor our entire church family, the best of the best from Easton to Reading, lead an incredible team of campus pastors, associate pastors and, and ministers and the best staff on the planet. We're so grateful to our amazing founding pastors for 33 years of loving, serving, leading and plowing for the cause of Christ. Come on, let's honor them wherever you are right now. Well, today we're kicking off our new series, This Is Love. Listen, church, true love can only be found in Him. Let me say that again because I don't want you to miss that. True love can only be found in Him. Each and every one of us are born with an inherent desire to be loved and, and to love. It's how God created us and ultimately we find that love in Him. And sadly, over the years, the world has redefined love. How we show and receive love has been corrupted and, and to be honest, perverted by a worldview of love. There's a great portion of scripture which talks about the night that Jesus was arrested. He had just finished celebrating Passover with his disciples and served them by washing their feet. At that moment, there was a supernatural exchange that occurred between Jesus and his disciples. He gave to them and to humanity a whole new purpose for which to live. John 13, 34 to 35 says this, I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. And so over the next few weeks, we'll be unpacking and answering the question, this very simple question, but important question, what is? is love. Well, before we go any further, let's, let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for this moment in our stories, this moment in our history. Father God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak through, speak through me, this very broken vessel, to these amazing people that are listening today, that are watching today. Let your word fall into their hearts, into good ground, and produce much fruit. Holy Spirit, speak in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, here's the question again. What is love? Funny enough, as I was preparing for today's message, I couldn't get this song out of my head. What's love got to do with it? Come on, let's dance together. Actually, I'm not gonna dance. I don't wanna embarrass myself, but you can dance to it. It should be playing right now. You should be hearing it right this moment. Why don't you do a little dance? Who cares who's parked next to you? Just dance. It's okay. It's okay to dance in church. All right, anyway, in all seriousness, what's love got to do with it? Especially living in a culture where we really don't understand love. We, do we? Here's the reality, love is a difficult word to define. It's actually pretty complicated when you think about it because we tend to use the word love broadly in, in our everyday lives. For those of you who don't know, my mom's side of the family is Colombian, so I'm Colombian. And here's a picture on the screen of my mom, my dad, and Pastor Maribel and my wife. But we grew up speaking Spanish at home. It was actually my first language because my dad traveled a lot. And so my mom wouldn't respond to us if we didn't talk to her in Spanish. And then in college, I studied Latin American studies. I started my business career with, it, with aspirations of doing business in Latin American countries. And when I started my ministry leadership about 20 years ago, I was leading missions and traveling and speaking in Latin American countries. And here's what's interesting about the Spanish language specifically is there are words that have multiple meanings. This got me in trouble a few time, times on my mission trips. One time, actually, when we were in Guatemala and I was speaking in front of a bunch of high schoolers, and to make matters worse, a bunch of high school girls, and I, I used a word that in Colombian dialect, specifically the town my family is from, means one thing, 
But in Guatemala, it means something else. Not just something else, but actually something pretty inappropriate. And so pretty quickly, I realized that I had said something wrong as the entire place erupted in laughter and our host, which is actually now our Bethlehem campus pastor, Pastor David Mann, came running over and, and whispered in my ear, yeah, not good at all. Funny now, humiliating, absolutely, absolutely humiliating then. It's the same thing with the word love, right? We say we love our wives or our husbands, but we also say that we love steak, or we love our favorite football team, go Eagles, or we love Jesus. It's the same word, but it's different, right? Do we mean the same thing when we say we love Jesus and pizza? Is it the same kind of love? We have one word for love and we have to stretch it across many different constructs. See, we tend to use the word love in, in two ways, just, just my thoughts here. We use it to describe a strong like for something. I love steak, I love the eagles, or a romantic feeling or desire, I love my wife. John, who is said to be the disciple that Jesus loved, wrote this in 1 John 3.16, the, the other 3.16. And the scripture says, says this, and like I said, in 1 John 3.16 to 18, says, this is how we know what love is. You want to know the definition of love, what it means, how to use it, how to, how to do it. Here it is. Here's what it looks like. Here's what he says. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, then how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. If we're going to define love and answer the question, what is love? Then I think it, I think John describes it the best in just three verses. Three thoughts, three important ideas about love, what it means to express and embody the love of God. If you're, if you're able to, I'd encourage you to write these three thoughts down. The first thought is love gives. Love gives. In verse 16, he says, Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. When John starts to define what love is, he doesn't just start with describing feelings or, or emotions or desires or his opinions on what love is, and then try to pigeonhole Jesus into those. No way, that's not what he does. Instead, he looks at Jesus. He looks at Jesus. See, that's how we're supposed to do it. Not just in the area of love, but in all areas of our life. It's why very rarely you hear me call myself a Christian. Instead, I'll say I'm a, a Jesus follower because we are supposed to look at him, look at Jesus, how he lived and do it the way he did it. The author of Hebrews in, uh, in chapter 12, verse 2 says, study how he did it. Listen to me, please don't miss this. This is so critical and I'm making a pretty strong theological point at this moment in our sermon today. We don't get to define our lives for ourselves. When we're Jesus followers, do we have choices? Totally, absolutely. But how we live must be defined by how Jesus lived. We look to Jesus for how we live we, and how we think, so forth and so on. So if we wanna know what love looks like, then guess what? We have to look at Jesus. Let me say that again. If you want to know what love looks like, look at Jesus. Okay, then what did Jesus do? Jesus laid his life down. He gave. He sacrificed. That's what love does. It gives. It sacrifices. It lays down its own wants, its own needs, its own desires for the sake of the one it loves. Love gives. In the book of John, another book written by the disciple Jesus loved, we all know this portion of scripture. He says this in John 3, 16. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. What did it say? He gave. This is what love is all about. It puts aside our own wants and our own needs. See, many of us who are our parents can relate to this, right? Especially with newborns. When that little baby is born, everything changes. 
I remember when my oldest daughter, Annabelle, before she was born, our, I said to my wife, I said, what if, what, if I don't, what if I don't love her? Well, the minute I saw her, my world stopped. Everything changed. Her little finger gripped my, my finger. Her little hand gripped my finger. And it was like a, I knew her forever. Then, then, you know, you bring them home and it doesn't even matter that they poop all the way up their backs and on your shirt or, or they projectile vomit into your mouth. We, we just don't care. We don't care that we used to get a full eight hours of sleep and now we get a full eight minutes of sleep. We're willing to be up all night if need be for our kids, right? I'd be willing to sacrifice it all for them. My own life, why? Because love gives. If you've stayed up really late on Christmas Eve putting together a Barbie house, you understand. You know what love looks like. Or, or you rang door, doorbells for hours selling Girl Scout cookies. Or sat at a Friday night football game in 32 degree weather. You know what love looks like because love gives. It sacrifices. It lays down itself for the one it loves. If you ever had to have a crucial conversation with a family member that is making poor choices in their life and, and you know there was a chance that you would be called a hater or judgmental or, God forbid, religious, maybe even lose that relationship, but you did it anyway, you know what love looks like. Love gives. It carries the burdens of others. Paul in Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says this. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. Let's also look at verse 6. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. In other words, he wasn't trying to keep up with the Joneses or climb the corporate ladder. No, no, no. Here's what he did. He gave up. Jesus loved us so much that he became one of us so that he could bear our burdens. He became human to show us how to be human. Jesus came as a human so he could die on a cross so that we could be free from the bondage of sin and death in our lives. Love gives. Second thought that John lays out in 1 John chapter 3 is that love sees. This is so good and probably my favorite of the three. What do I mean by that? Let's look at verse 17. Scripture says this, If anyone has material possession and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? All throughout Scripture, a heart of generosity, a heart of compassion is linked to, to your vision. Let me explain. Proverbs 22 verse 9 says this, He who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. The scriptures tell us that when Jesus would look at the crowds or look at someone who was sick, he would be filled with compassion. It started with him seeing them. When God sees us, it means he's looking at us in love. Church, please don't miss what I'm about to say. One of the greatest gifts you can give to someone is to see them. Do you know what it feels like to be invisible? To have no one notice you? To feel like the world is passing you by? No one sees your struggles, sees what you're going through, doesn't see your pain like you literally, literally live on an island alone. It's a tough and, and sad place to be. I've had those moments in my life. Many of you may be living in that moment right now. But when someone comes alongside you and actually sees you, sees your pain, sees your struggle, they actually see you, they empathize with you, they identify with your pain, even for just a moment. I can imagine it's, it's like that for those of you who have been in, in war and you run into someone else who fought in war. It's like, you get me. You've seen the things I've seen. You've felt the things I've felt. You see me. It feels so good when someone sees you. It feels like love. One of the things that I try to do every time I'm preaching is not just give a strong theologically rooted sermon, but to take you on a journey, a journey where where you see Jesus and you realize he sees you, a journey where you see me and, and I see you where you truly experience the seeing of the God of the universe. God sees us. But we're also called to, to see other people. We're called to see 
other people. That's what love is, where we can, even for a moment, look at people, empathize with their situation, seek to understand what they're going through. There's something powerful, supernatural in that love sees. About 15, 16 years ago, I was working in Washington, D.C., and every day on my way to the office, I would stop in a local CVS and get myself a drink and a snack. I did this for months, and for months, I missed something that was right in front of me. And so one day, I walked out of the store going through my normal routine, and I, I heard the voice of God I, I so clearly. I heard his voice in my spirit say, turn around and look, see. When I turned around, there was a homeless man there sitting on the sidewalk, literally opening and closing the door for people. Without even realizing it, for at least two months, I went in and out of that door, a door that was being opened for me and closed for me by this man, and I never saw him. Wow, never saw his, his needs. I never saw his pain. I never saw his struggle until that day. And once I saw him, I went and I connected with him. It changed me more than it changed him. See, love sees. Listen, church, we're walking away. We're walking way too quickly through the crowds. There are single moms that could use some help at the grocery store when they have their hands full at, with groceries and kids. There are senior citizens that may need you to open a door for them. There just may be a, a woman who is broken, abused, and could use some help, or maybe a person at the register who just got devastating news about the death of a loved one who could use an encouraging word. But we are too busy to walk slowly through the crowd and to see. What a gift we can give to people to see them where they're at. There's a great story in, in Luke chapter 7 where Jesus is invited to the home of a Pharisee to have dinner. Pharisees were religious leaders of the time, well respected for their position and, and authority and, and knowledge. So, of course, being invited to their home would be, would be quite an honor, right? Well, that's what they, that's what they would think. So Jesus is there having dinner and, and a street woman comes and starts kissing Jesus, crying, pouring expensive perfume on his feet. This wasn't just any woman. This was a woman with a, a reputation full of sin. And here's what the Pharisee Simon says in Luke chapter 7 verse 39. When the Pharisee who had been invited him, who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. All that Simon could see was this woman's brokenness. He could only see her past, her mistakes, her sins, her baggage. And a, a few verses later, we read something that is so incredibly powerful and so incredibly important. And as we study how Jesus did it, as we lean into him, here's what he actually says. Verse 44, then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see this woman? I mean, really see this woman. You don't even, even see her. All you see is her brokenness, her issues. Do you really see her? Because what I see is a woman who washed my feet, who showed me affection and love through kisses, who honored me by putting oil on my head. That's what I see, Simon. Behind her brokenness, I see something beautiful. How many moments in our lives do we not see people? The greatest gift we can give to someone is to see them. If you read on in the story, when she was seen, she was saved. Let me say that again. That's so good. When she was seen, she was saved. There are opportunities all around us to see people in order to help them get saved. God sees us. And because he sees us, we in turn need to see others. Let me say that again. God sees us and because he sees us, we see others. Not through the lens of our past or our brokenness, but through the eyes of faith, through the eyes of potential, of grace, of mercy, of love. Love gives, love sees, and finally as I close today, love does. Going back to 1 John chapter 3, looking at verse 18, the scripture says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. 
John was the one who came up with the phrase, actions speak louder than words. In other words, it's really easy to talk about how much we love people or care about people, but until it shows up in our actions, guess what? It's just words. See, John would say the greatest way you can put love in action is to do something with the resources that you have in your hands, with the gifts and the talents that God has implanted in you, not just to serve your own needs or wants, but to serve others. John's saying, until I see it show up on your, on your schedule or in your budget, I'm not really sure you're being completely honest. There's one thing to talk about it. There's another thing to do it. Compassion by the way, is in action. It's the same love that Jesus showed us. He didn't just show up one day and tell everyone, hey, I love you, 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 I love you. No, no, no. He showed up and he healed people. He showed up and he died on a cross. Love does. Compassion is in action. Love comes with a sacrifice and it requires action. Life Church, we give because we want to be people of action, of doing, not just saying, why do we sacrifice? Why do we give? There's an amazing woman in our church and she experienced some incredible amounts of loss over the last few years, losing multiple close family members and an interaction with someone who comes to a life church and invited her to church, it changed her life. Her circumstances didn't change, but her perspective change. She was able to then connect with my wife, Pastor Andrea. She was able to get in one of our groups. This young lady experienced things no person should ever experience in their life. But because of the generosity of you, because of your love, Life Church, we were able to pay for her counseling, provide groups, and continue to walk alongside of her. It's because of people like her, people like me, people like you. See, love gives. Love sees, love does. Can I pray for you? Father God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. I pray for those that are, are struggling in this moment on the other side of this screen today, struggling with being seen, struggling with being loved. I pray right now that your love would just surround them, that they would sense your love right where they're at that you would bring people into their lives that would, that would show them authentic, transparent, true love that only comes from Father God. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus for anyone that is listening today, that is watching today, that is on the other side of this screen today, that has not committed their life to Jesus Christ, that has a destiny to hell, I pray that they would be now destined to heaven by simply saying yes to Jesus. I pray that right now in the name of Jesus, that the whole, your Holy Spirit, Father God, would touch their hearts, would prick their hearts, would draw them near to you. That even now, even now in this moment, that they would simply say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord over my life. I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Forgive me of my sins. From this day forward, I'm going to walk with you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God, for those that have made that decision today those that were lost but now are found, those that are now destined to heaven, thank you, Father God, for their lives. I celebrate them today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. But we're not done yet. Don't go anywhere. We, we've only just begun. Service isn't even close to being over. Listen, as Jesus followers, don't miss this, what I'm about to say. Our greatest response to the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God is to give back to Him to worship him with our voices and our generosity. So let's honor him through worship right now.